Welcome back to CS520. Today I want to talk about the Java Virtual Machine. Again, we're going to contrast it with the toy machine we've seen already, the M520. So what 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 are you going to notice that's different as we dig in and look at this real mich real virtual machine for Java? Well, first of all, it's a stack-based machine. What do we mean by that? Well, the operands are implicit to the operations, to the instructions, and this allows for more compact programs. Let me show you an example. In VM520, to add two integers together, we said add i, add integer, and we specified two operands, register 5 and register 6. In the JVM, in the Java Virtual Machine, as we'll see, we'll just have to say integer add, that's it, because there's an implicit stack inside the virtual machine, and when we do an add, we're implicitly adding the top two ad, top two operands on the, on the stack and putting the result back onto the stack. So we pop the two input operands off, add them together, and then push the result back. So the operands are always explicit. This means the programs can be more compact because often we just represent the opcode and don't have to represent the operands. So that's one difference that we're going to see. What else is going to look different? When we look at the actual program encoding, how the instructions are actually encoded, we'll see that the JVM has variable length instructions. So there'll be instructions that are just one byte long, like the integer add we just looked at. It's just one byte and it just specifies the opcode. But we'll also see instructions like dstore4, which is two bytes long. It's the opcode, which is dstore, but it also provides what's known as a local slot number. Basically, we're storing to a particular local variable, which is implemented as a slot um, in the stack frame. I have to define some of these terms on the next slide. But that's another difference. Is the, in VM520, all the instructions were the same length. Here, we have variable length instructions. So what are some of the key runtime data structures inside the virtual machine? Uh, well, we have a program counter, like always, right? It's the address of the instruction currently being executed. Nothing new there. On this machine, we have a stack. Um, VM520 has a stack, too. We haven't talked too much about it, but it has a stack as well, but this machine, the Java VM, definitely has a stack because it's storing the operands to the instructions as we saw, but more importantly it stores frames. It's a block of memory created for a method invocation. Um, so every time you invoke a method you get a blob, a block of memory pushed on top of the stack to be used by that invocation of that method. And the stack frame contains local variables, those are the local slot numbers that that the uh, store instruction was referring to on the prior slide. We have partial results. These are the operands being pushed onto the stack and then operated on to implement an expression. And then also we have return addresses because when you call a method you have to remember where to go back to when the method completes. That's called the return address. So why? Why do we store frames on top of a stack. Well, think back or, or think about recursion. Okay, we have recursive methods. How are those going to be implemented? Well, there could be many invocations of a particular method alive at the same time. So we need some way to create multiple copies of local variables, one for each uh, living invocation. Um, Again, going back to the machine I grew up on, the CDC 6600, it didn't have a runtime stack like this, so recursion was difficult. In fact, when I first started programming the machine, Fortran that we were using at the time was not recursive. It was only later that they uh, supported recursion in, in uh, Fortran, because a lot of the early machines simply weren't built to do recursion in a straightforward way anyways. Okay. What else we're going to find on the inside 
of a GIF running Java virtual machine. Well, in addition, of course, there's a heap. That's the name given to a place where we store objects. And as you probably know, that heap is garbage collected in Java. Uh, we're going to talk about garbage collection later in this course. And then there's a method area, which is where you store the instructions for the methods, okay, the encoded instructions. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit in this lecture. Another area that's going to be important as we to understand the execution of a program is something called the constant pool. This stores constant data, you know, like the constant 10 or the constant 1.5 or a string. But it also costs, stores metadata because um, Java is a little bit unusual when you compare it to C or C++ in that there's a lot of uh, information about the program that usually a compiler strips away, but in Java it's kept around. Things like field names and types, uh, met method signatures, all this stuff is kept around at runtime. Um, and it's actually available to the program via reflection. You'll probably learn about that when you take CS671. So then, all right, so to, to study the JVM, I, we're going to look at a very simple example program. Um, program computes pi and it does um, numeric integration. So it's actually computing the integral over the interval 0 to 1 of this function of x. Turns out if you, if you integrate that, in other words compute the area under the curve in that interval the value is pi. So what's numeric integration? Again, it's the idea of, of uh, approximating the area under that curve. And we can just do it with uh, by computing the sum of the areas of a bunch of rectangles. So we divide the interval 0 to 1 up into a bunch of subintervals. If we compute the function value at the midpoints of these subintervals, we can then compute the area of each of these rectangles, right? The area of this rectangle is this width times the height, which is in fact the function value there. And we can compute those areas um, for all these subintervals, for all these rectangles, and then sum them up. And you'll see it will give you an approximation to the area of the curve. Sometimes the uh, area of this rectangle is probably a little bit more than it than it should be. This one looks pretty well balanced. The extra part here maybe carries over for the missing part there, so on down here. And the idea is if you do enough of these intervals you get a pretty good approximation. Uh, my diagram is a little bit flawed here because I this last interval is not the same width. As we'll see in the program we assume all the subintervals are the same width. So all we're really doing is we are computing the function value at the midpoint of every rectangle, midpoint of every subinterval, and then multiplying by the width in order to compute the area. So it's a pretty simple program. Let me show you the Java code for that. Okay, so I've just defined a class pi, and it just has a main method here. Uh, which does what I just said. It basically has a for loop to loop over all the intervals. In this case I'm using 400,000 intervals. Um, this is actually evaluating the function. This is the 4 over the 1 plus x squared. And I'm updating, you know, I'm, I'm giving a range of x by just using the width of the interval, which is just 1. That's the interval 0 to 1 divided by the number of intervals. So the width of a subinterval is that value. <clears throat> I start my x value out um, down here close to 0, and then I'm just incrementing x each iteration of the loop by the width. In the middle here, in the, in the middle of this for loop, then I'm computing the sum of all these function values. And finally, I just multiply by the width in order to get the final area. And if, in essence, I factored out. Rather than doing the multiplication every iteration, 
I just sum up the function values and then multiply once and then print out the result. Okay, fairly simple program and what I'm really interested in is not that program per se but rather looking at how that program is implemented inside the JVM. So given a, a Java class file like that, sorry, a Java source code file like that, right, this is probably called pi.java, right, and I can, I can compile that. in order to produce what's called a class file. We'll look at the structure of the class file a little bit later, but it's, it's analogous to an object file for a C program, an O file for a C program. And let me show you now, if I look at what's inside a class file, initially I'm just going to be focused on the code. I uh, could get something like this. This is actually a disassembly, so we call this a disassembly of a class file, pi.class. Basically, I'm taking a class file and dumping it back out in human-readable format. Um, and by the way, if you want to know how to do that, it's Java P dash C just in order to see the code actually otherwise you're just going to see the method signatures basically and field names and things like that but I would say Java P dash C and then the name of the class okay, and I'm seeing a, a dump out of in this particular case mostly I'm seeing the code which is what I'm interested in uh, again, we'll come back and take a qu quick look at the structure of a class file in, at the end of this lecture. So to understand this, you need some, obviously you need some documentation, just like we had some web pages for VM520. Sun and now Oracle has extensive documentation for Java and the JVM. In particular, I'm going to be relying on this document, which is linked from the course website. And to me, this is a tremendously easy to read document. It's very precise. Um, if you have to actually do some programming surrounding the Java Virtual Machine, you'll, you'll, you'll feel lucky that you have such a well-specified, um, you know, well-written specification for the JVM. So you might want to take a look at that. I'll be showing you pieces of it as we go along. Uh, Okay, so let's go back to this program. Again, this is the disassembly. So we're looking at the program below the Java source code. We're looking at what's actually, what the Java source code's compiled into, and then what's actually executed on the JVM. Remember, the JVM is a virtual machine, so these instructions don't execute directly on top of your Intel machine. Rather, there's a program, a mix of C and Intel Assembler that's written to provide an implementation of the virtual machine. Okay, first we see the constructor up here. I'm actually going to skip the constructor. It's a default constructor provided by automatically by the compiler because the programmer didn't specify one. It's not very interesting. Let's let's look at the guts of this program, which is really this main routine. Okay. Now this, this readout, let me just show you, this is the first instruction, you know, so this is the list of instructions that make up the code for this method. This is actually an offset into the uh, compiled code, the machine code, or what Java people call byte code. So this instruction is at the beginning, at the zero offset. You notice the second instruction is at offset 3, which means this instruction is 3 bytes long. Third instruction is at offset 5, which means this one is 2 bytes long. Fourth instruction is at offset 6, which means the third instruction is only 1 byte long. So again, you can see this is the instructions are variable length. Okay, to understand what's going on, let me pop the Java code back in here too. And I happen to know that the Java um, 
Java, Java compiler is going to assign local variable numbers, local variable slot numbers in the frame for the method in the following way. I think um, this is a static method, so there's no this pointer. So the first, the first uh, local slot is going to be for this. It'll be slot zero. And the integer i is going to be slot one. Sum is going to be slot two. And now I also know that uh, doubles take up two slots. The virtual machine is um, integers are 32 bits. Floats are 32 bits. Doubles are 64 bits. So they the units for local slots are really 32 bits. So these are all three of these are going to take up two slots, which means they're going to be in those slot numbers. Okay, that's going to be important to us as we go along here. Let's look now what happens in the program. Let's look at the first instruction. The first instruction is a little bit mysterious, even to me when I look at this. It's a load, a constant, sort of a double double constant. That's what the two means, and it uses a wide index. Um, let's, let's try to decipher what that means. Let's go look in the, again, we're going to go look at the Java virtual machine spec, right, this document. We'll look up this instruction. Right, and it tells us, first of all, what it does is it pushes a long or a double, so an, an 8 byte quantity, from the constant pool, and it uses a wide index. The format of the instruction is the opcode. The first byte is an opcode. And then it's two bytes for an index into the constant pool. And that's what they mean by a wide index. It means that the index consumes two bytes in the uh, machine code. Okay. And they also provide us the encoding for the opcode. It's hex 1-4. And they describe, they describe exactly how the instruction works. Um, including how you put these two bytes together. All right, the first byte is shifted over by 8-bit positions and then the second byte's is in underneath. So this means, if you think about it, this means it's big Indian. All right, that, that two byte index gets put together. The first byte is the high byte, the second byte is the low byte. Okay. So the disassembler then tells us actually that it's, it's written to be load a constant at index 2 and the disassembler goes out to the constant pool and actually looks up and finds the value. It's this value. Um, and what the heck does that have to do with the source code? Well, um, it's actually the result of this division over here. It's 1 divided by the number of intervals. So the compiler looked at this and saw a constant being divided by a constant, and so it just did the division at, at compile time and put the resulting value in the constant pool. And at right now at runtime, when this program runs, we just load the result of that division. So that's a little bit of an optimization to make the program run a little faster, I suppose. Not very important here, but it might be important if it was in the inner loop of some uh, computationally intensive program. All right, so that's the first instruction. Notice again, it took three bytes. We understand why now. Second instruction does a D store to four. That's D store four. Again, we can look it up. Let's go ahead and do that. We look it up, and it tells us that D store stores a double into a local variable. It's a two-byte instruction, the dstore opcode, which is hex 39, followed by the index of the local variable slot. And it explains what it does down there. In fact, I should back up for a minute and just, just talk about representation just for a second. Let's go back and see LCD, LDC2W was 14, so the opcode would have been 14. And it would have been at index 
2. So that would have been 0, 0, 0, 2. So that's how that instruction would have been encoded. Okay, and what about dstore? The dstore opcode is 39. And the index is 4. So it would be like that. Again, we're viewing the program like bits, like data. All right. Notice that those two instructions there implemented implemented this assignment statement. Again, the division was done ahead of time by the compiler, so we were assigning a constant to width. Width is in slot 4, and that's what that dstore operated on, slot 4. Okay. Let's go on to the next instruction. Next instruction is dconst under bar 0, and we can look up that instruction in the JVM spec, and it pushes a double on top of the stack. Which double? Well, it's special case here. Dconst 0 means it's going to push floating point 0, 0.0 onto the operand stack. And that's what we're dealing with here, Dconst 0, right? And again, it tells us that the opcode for Dconst 0 is 0 and hex is 0e. So this is going to be a 0e. And it's just a one byte instruction because the operand is implied. The 0.0, .0 is implied completely by the opcode. So they, they've cooked up special case opcodes here, trying again to make the program smaller. Why did why I forgot to mention why would they why are they interested in making the program smaller? Well, the smaller programs are gonna be um, take less time to read them out of memory for one thing. Um, Another thing is originally Java, one of the big design goals was to be able to uh, move Java code around on the internet. And so they may have been worried about the cost of shipping Java code uh, across the internet. S obviously smaller code would move faster. But you can see they went to a lot of trouble here, even int introducing special case opcodes for very special cases, the loading of, in this case, the loading of either 0, .0 uh, the value 0, 0.0 onto the stack. Okay, the next instruction is a dstore2. We can probably guess what that means. It means store the value on top of the stack, which was the 0, 0.0 we just loaded, into local slot 2. Um, this is a, again, completes the execution of another assignment statement in the Java source code. It's this one, right? Sum is in local slot 2. And we just put 0 into local slot 2. Okay. Let's, let's look at another one. Um, another assignment statement. The next assignment statement wants to take width and multiply it by a constant and store that in x. Width, again, is in slot 4. x is in slot 6. So we see a d load of 4. That's loading the value of width. You see the load of a constant. So now we got a, two values on top of the stack, and now you see one of these short opcodes. Dmol is a short instruction, it's just one byte, and it's multiplying the two values I just pushed on top of the stack. So those two values get popped off, multiply gets done, and the result gets stored back on top of the stack. And then we see a D store to six. Again, six is the local slot that X has been put in. So we're storing that value back to x. Okay. Let's go a little bit further. Um, I don't want to wear you out or bore you to death, but let's let's look a little bit further. Let's look at how the for loop is is implemented. Um, what we're seeing here is is i const zero, so the integer value is zero. You can probably guess that's what that means. It's being loaded on top of the stack, and I immediately store it in local slot one. Well, local slot one is where i has been placed. So that's the initialization of i to zero, the first part of the for loop. Um, 
Now I do an I load one, so I immediately load I back on top of the stack. I load a constant, which is this 400,000. Again, that's the number of intervals. And then I do an if compare greater than or equal, and there's an offset of 50 in here. This is the um, this is the implementation of this condition, but it's sort of the reverse, right? The condition says if i is less than that, I want to do the body of the loop. What the compiler has decided to do was put an opcode out here that says if i is greater than or equal to intervals, I want to exit the loop. And 50 is the exit point of the loop. So what we're doing is we're coming way down here into the code to 50, which is going to be after the end of the for loop. You can see right before that instruction at address 50 is a go to, go to 17, which is to come back up to the test. So a go to is what you, it's like, it's a jump instruction. It, it sets the PC back to 17 by coming up here, which is the start of where the loop condition is evaluated. However, let's look at how these instructions are actually uh, represented. If we go look at the if, if integer compare instruction. Again, we're doing, we're doing greater than or equal. So that's an opcode of uh, A2. But let's let's take a look and read this description down here. You know, if the comparison succeeds, then the unsigned branch byte one, again going back up here, it's a three byte, three byte instruction, opcode and then two branch bytes. So if the comparison succeeds, the unsigned branch byte one and two are used to construct a signed 16-bit offset. Again, it's, it describes a big Indian way to put those together. An execution then proceeds at that offset from the address of the opcode of this instruction. So um, the 50 has actually been computed by the disassembler. It's not actually what's stored in the instruction. What's going to be stored in the instruction is a value that when added to the current program counter value of 20 will get me to 50. So in fact, I want to do uh, an offset of 30. So if we looked in and so looked at the actual bytes that make up the machine code, we would see this. Right, a two byte offset with a value of 30, right? One E in hex. And that's added at runtime, it's added to the current PC value of 20 to get us so that the next instruction that executes is down here at 50. Again, this offset is added to the current PC, stored into the PC so that the next instruction would be down here if the condition is true. If the condition is false and the PC is not updated, you would just fall into the body of the loop. All right. You may want to dig into this. The body of the loop is a little bit interesting because there's a complicated somewhat complicated expression here to evaluate the function, right? There's x is multiplied, added to 1, and then 4.0 is divided by that, and then there's a plus equals sum. You know, maybe we can take a very quick spin through here. Sun, sum is at offset at local slot 2. So you see the implementation of that long instruction is, is load the value of sum on top of the stack. Load the 4.0 on top of the stack. Load 1.0 on top of the stack, load x slot 6 twice. So we got all this stuff on top of the stack. Now we start consuming it. Right? We do a multiply which consumes the two values of x and multiplies them together. Then we do an add. So that's this part. And we do an add which will consume the 1.0 and the result of the multiply. All right, and that adds those together. Then we do a divide because now Think top two things on the stack will be the result of that addition and the double constant 1.0. I think I may have said that wrong. The thing on top of the stack now will be the 
will be the 4.0 from here uh, that will then be divided into the result of that addition. Then we'll do a d add, which is which is the add inside that plus equal. So we're adding it to the value of sum that we put on top of the stack at the beginning of the of this. And finally, down here, we do a d store two to store the result of that second addition back into sum. So if you look at all of these instructions here are to implement that one assignment, that one plus equal assignment. Okay. All right. So I guess might as well just complete this. So we can look at these last few things. So the D load six is to load sum again. This is the load width. Uh, we add those together and store it back into. Sorry, this is the load x and the load width. We add them together. That's to do this. And then we destore it back into x. So that is to uh, do the second statement inside the for loop body. All right, then we have an increment of i by the value 1. That's to do this part of the for loop header. And then we have the go to 17 to jump back to retest the condition up here. Again, we look at the go to 17, we'll see, look at the go to instructions, we'll see that the instruction itself won't store 17 in here. Rather, it will store something to be added to the PC to get 17. This is a backward branch, so it's going to have to be negative. Right, I've got a current PC of 47. So the current PC plus some offset in order to get the new PC. The current PC is 47. We want to go back to 17. So I've got to do minus 30 here. All right, minus 30, what is that value? Well, positive 30, as we just saw, was 1e. So there's 1e. I have to do the two's complement. So. And it's 16 bits, so actually there'll be some more 1 bits out here. So what I'll see in there is FFE2. So this go to statement, again, I have to look. Go to is, opcode is A7. Code is A7. Let's just make sure I got this right. And then there's the two branches, branch bytes to form the offset to be added to the PC. And I just computed those to be FFE2. That's what you'd actually see in the machine code for that instruction. Okay. So I hope you got the idea now how Java compilers translate Java source code into Java instructions and a little bit of information about how the Java instructions are actually encoded as bits. Um, Let's finish up by looking at what a class file looks like. Again, we can go back to the master document and include it in there. It will be a description of the class file. And the class file is, you know, again, as I said earlier, analogous to um, an object file for C programs. And this, this defines the overall structure. There's, there's um, these U2 and U4s are, you know, four, four byte unsigned integers or two byte unsigned integers. Um, and there's some more complicated structures in here. I'm not going to dig into all those details right now. Um, but if you look at the big picture, you'll see there's a, there's a magic number on the front to help 
software to quickly identify if something is definitely not a class file. There's also some version numbers for, you know, what JVM this class file was produced for. Um, and then there's the, the basically the four big, one of the, one of the four big sections, right? The constant pool that we talked about. This is where all the constant data is stored. There's some access flags, some information about the current class and the super class. And there's interfaces defined by that class, the fields defined by that class, and the methods defined by that class. And inside here, you'll find, kind of buried inside here, you'll find the actual bytecode that implements the method. So if, if we do an OD dump of the class file for this Pi program, it's going to be a whole bunch of bytes. Um, and a lot of this is the constant pool up here. Buried way down in here is the code for the main method. And if we look back at what I was doing here, I said the main method started out with instruction 140002-3904. There's the 140002-3904-0E. So these are the instructions that were being disassembled that we were looking at a moment ago, and it goes all the way down to this B1. The B1 is, in fact, the return instruction at the end of the method. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of the JVM, sort of what it basically looks like, and um, how programs are encoded. Let's stop here.